Welcome to Christ Life Today, where we explore the glorious realities of life in Jesus Christ. Be talking tonight, the armor of God, I call it part three, the belt of truth. Uh, and so this is the first piece of the armor of God. Uh, I'm going to be reading a few scriptures here. We'll start with Ephesians 6, 14. It says, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, tonight we're focusing on the loins girt about with truth, the belt of truth. Um, I'm going to read a few other verses. 1 Peter 1.13, which says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there we've got girding up the loins of our mind. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 14.6, uh, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. There's the truth uh, we're talking about. John 17.17, 17, Jesus prayed and he said, Sanctify them in the truth, thy word is truth. So the belt of truth, those are, you know, the loins and the belt of truth. That's why the reasons I pulled some of those out. Um, the important thing there is the definition of truth, at least from God's perspective. Uh, the belt of truth, I mean, I can say people need oxygen to live. That's the truth. That's not exactly what we're talking about here when we're talking about the armor of God. The armor of God, we're talking about spiritual truth. Needing oxygen to live is a physical truth, but what is the definition of truth that I want to focus on and I believe God focuses on? Uh, that comes from John 14, 6 and John 17, 17. Those are the two things that I like to focus on as what the Bible defines as truth. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That truth is an intimate, inseparable part of the belt of the armor of God, Jesus. I mean, in Him all things are held together. So we can't, we can't separate that truth and out from the armor of God. John 17, 17, Jesus is praying to His Father, uh, and uh, he prays for his disciples and for us. And he says, Saint, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. So there we see the same thing talked about that Jesus is praying that Paul talks about is that all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for training and instruction in righteousness. Um, so the word of God which Jesus quoted when he was tempted by the devil. I love that. Here he is, God the Son, being tempted by the devil, and he uses the word of God to, in self-defense. Satan says, do this. Jesus said, it is written. You know? And so the truth that we want to focus on is Jesus and the Bible. Inseparable. Uh, a lot of times we refer to Jesus as the living word and the Bible as the written word. I don't even like that distinction because you can't take and separate them. Uh, to take the Bible and separate the word of God, the written word, from Jesus, the living word, I can't even fathom how that separation, how we can sever that. Uh, Jesus quoted the Bible to the devil. And then many, many times in the, in the Gospels, he quotes and refers to the Old Testament um, Scripture. So to me, that's an artificial separation. I understand what people mean when they say it, but I, I generally stay away from making that distinction. Um, so that's the definition of the word truth, the belt of truth that we're supposed to be taking on as the first piece of the armor of God. 
The definition I'm working with is the two things that I pointed out that God says are true, Jesus and his word. So, when we talk about the belt of truth, that's what we're talking about. Now, Paul was very familiar with the armor of the Roman soldier. He was in prison, Roman soldier guards. Uh, he was familiar with what the armor of the Roman soldier looked like. Um, seen it quite regular, you know, in his uh, imprisonments and things like that. So, when we look at this, uh, I, I know last week, I think it was that I mentioned, Paul was also familiar with the Greek Olympics, having taught in Corinth for a year and a half, and Corinth was one of the four major Olympic cities in Greece. So we wrestle, that's an Olympic term, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Uh, and now we're talking about the armor, Paul's taking a physical each piece, a physical piece of the Roman armor and making a spiritual analogy to it. So today's piece is the belt of truth, but the Roman soldier, the belt was a critical piece of the armor. Basically, the belt kind of held most of the rest of the armor together. Um, at least the, you know, in some parts of it. The breastplate was attached to the belt so that it wouldn't flop up, you know, as you're going into battle, all of a sudden a nice gust of wind comes and your breastplate flies in front of your face. It's not protecting your chest, which is where the guy's going to plant his sword, and you can't see to defend yourself. The breastplate was attached to the belt, which would keep it down and keep it in place from that end of things. Um, <clears throat> it basically... It, the belt was essential, all the pieces of the armor we talked about last week, but the belt was essential in battle. I mean, you know, we might think of a belt, you know, it holds our pants up or something like that, but the belt and the armor was far more than just, you know, hold your pants up. The belt and the armor, uh, if it wasn't worn properly, it could cost a soldier's life. Now, the Roman soldiers had well-regimented armor, but... If non-Romans or, or uh, a military that didn't have that kind of armor would go into battle, one of the things that they would do with the belt, if because you know they wore those long robe type things, one of the things they would do with the belt is they would grab it, all the flowing robe things, tuck it into the belt, so that when you were going into battle. You didn't trip over your robe and fall in front of the guy with the sword. Another bad thing to have happen in battle. Uh, you trip, fall, the guy with the sword's right in front of you. He doesn't stand there and say, oh, here, let me help you up. He says, stay down. <laughs> you know? Uh, so it, the belt was important for girding up all these flowing robes, which the Romans weren't wearing, but other people in battle would do that. And it would be tucked in tucked in securely into that belt. So if the belt wasn't worn properly, that could be a matter of life and death. <laughs> you don't want to tri trip and fall in front of the guy with the sword. It's just not a good thing. It doesn't make for a good day. Um, the, Romans, the Roman soldier's belt, back to the Roman armor, which Paul was familiar with, uh, the Roman soldier's belt was also his... Um, maybe what we would look at as a backpack. It was where he carried a lot of things. Um, he would carry a food pouch in one of the loops on his belt. He would carry additional swords. Uh, they had you know, longer swords that probably wouldn't have gotten so often carried on the belt, but they would have shorter daggers and swords that, they, that could come in handy if you lost your main weapon or in hand-to-hand -hand type of combat. Um, Another thing that would probably have been carried most often on Roman belts was the small, round, uh, Greek-style shield. Uh, the Roman shield was the tall one that was almost as tall as they were, and it was covered almost all their whole body. And that, was, that served a different purpose. But the small, round, Greek-style shield, that was for hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, deflect, 
counter, that type of thing. That would have been attached to the belt when not in use uh, as well. There would have been a rope and um, other types of equipment like that, which would have been secured in different loops on the Roman soldier's belt. So, clearly, pretty important piece of equipment. Um, you know, it, it's like I said, it's a little more than what we think of when we think of as a belt. I mean, you know, if uh, I guess today, for some women, anyhow, a belt is a fashion statement. Uh, you know, for most of us, it you know holds the pants up or whatever. But so our belts don't serve those kind of purposes. But very important to the Roman armor. Uh, so the spiritual application to this is truth which we've already defined as Jesus and the Word of God, uh, is the absolute key to effectively using God's spiritual armor. Without truth, Jesus and the Bible, the armor won't work right. Or worse, you'll have the wrong armor on. I mean, without truth, you may have the right armor on. You may be saved and you may be going to heaven and you may have God's armor on, but you're not going to use it right. Uh, or worse, without truth, you may be wearing somebody else's armor. <laughs> and that's uh, not a good thing. So, it's as the belt of truth and the, the belt of Roman armor held things together, the same is true with the spiritual, the belt of uh, truth, the, sp the spiritual armor of God. Truth holds everything together. Of course, that should be clear since Jesus is the truth. And, uh, you know, with him we can do all things. Without him we can do nothing. You know, so obviously truth holds it all together. And that's definitely in a uh, Jesus sense of the word. Um, but the Bible also holds things together. Uh, if we are wielding one of the pieces of the armor, the shield of faith, and we have a wrong idea of what faith is, it's not going to be real effective. Because we may think it's something, and in truth, it's something else. Uh, and so, we'll get into the shield when we get there, but uh, just the sword. I mean, you know, if you try using the sword of the Spirit, uh, you know, as a chainsaw, it doesn't work right. You know, so truth is critical to using all the different aspects of the armor. Um, if one is skillful at wielding the sword, but they don't have truth, they can be a powerful tool of deception. Because the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. If, you're, if, if a person's eloquent, versed, um, suave, slick with the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, but they don't have truth, they've got their slant on it or their own idea on it, that can be a real danger for leading people astray. And when Jesus' disciples asked him about the sign of the end of the world, the sign of his coming, the first words out of Jesus' mouth is, Take heed that no man deceive you, Matthew 24, 4. Mm -hmm. So that's why I regularly encourage, take notes. You know, uh, if, if a preacher teacher is referencing scripture, take notes. Uh, they make some comment, take some notes. Go look it up and see if what they're saying is true. Because the way I look at it is, if I'm slick enough to talk you into believing something today, somebody tomorrow will be slicker and can talk you into believing something else tomorrow. Whereas if you go and check it out, search the scriptures daily to see if these things are true, then it becomes yours. Then it's not, you know, well, just Pastor Dan said, you know, nothing personal, but... What I want to know is, what did God say? Mm -hmm. Hopefully Pastor Dan's saying the same thing, and he is, otherwise I wouldn't be here. But, uh, you know, uh, but the point is, it's great when the preacher or teacher is saying the right thing, and you're getting the right thing, but if you're not searching the scriptures for truth, 
The belt of truth, it's never really yours. It's somebody else's that they spoon fed you, you know, like a baby with some pablum or something like that. You got to make it yours. That's part of growing in and effectively wearing the belt of truth. Um, making it yours. Like I said, it's great if truth is being taught and that's what we want. But make sure it's truth. And God's given us a measuring stick right here. And God's not afraid of being tested by his word. The Holy Spirit patted the Bereans on the back for checking out the Apostle Paul. Said, good job, guys. You're more noble than those in Thessalonica because, uh, you know, you received what Paul said with all readiness of mind. Then you search the scriptures daily to see if what he said was true. So if the Holy Spirit says, good job checking out Paul, giving the Bereans a pat on the back, I'd say good job checking out anybody and everybody else. You know, uh, just makes sense to me. I'm going to read uh, 2 Timothy uh, 2.15, which is kind of what we're talking about right here, which says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that's kind of what we're talking about right here. Studying to show yourself approved. If the Thessalonians received what Paul said this week, and then Paul went to Berea, and then uh, Joe Schmo came to Thessalonica and preached something totally different than uh, what Paul preached, they're not workmen that needed not be ashamed. They should be ashamed. I probably said it before, I know I have, but Paul wrote two letters to the Thessalonians, both with lots of corrections, and he didn't write any letters to the Bereans. My guess is the Bereans didn't need any corrections because they searched the scripture daily to see if what every teacher was saying was true. So, study to show yourself approved. This, this verse is a mouthful. Study to show yourself approved unto God. I mean, I could understand studying to show yourself approved unto your professor or unto each other, but this is study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I looked up a couple of those words, which is not uh, uncommon for me, because I had kind of a thought, well, what kind of study is required to be approved to God? I mean, you're certainly not impressing him with your knowledge, I wouldn't think, <laughs> you know. Uh, you're certainly not excelling him in any way. So, uh, study, I looked up the word study, and uh, it means <clears throat> to hasten, make haste, to exert oneself, endeavor, give diligence. Now that's the kind of study that God's looking for. Make haste, exert yourself, and be diligent. Uh, I, I guess another way it might be said in the Bible is hunger and thirst. I mean, I've never really been hungry, like to the point of starvation. I've never really been thirsty to the point of if I don't get something to drink, I'm going to die. I felt hunger and I felt thirst and they're highly motivating factors. That's what this is saying. Be highly diligently motivated to study. That's the kind of study that leads to God's approval. And I'm probably jumping ahead of myself, but Hebrews 11, 6 says God rewards those that diligently seek him. So here again is the word diligent. Uh, I think some people get this idea that God's going to do it all for you and if we look around and we see unsuccessful Christians living in carnality 
and we think that God's going to do it all for us, does that mean God failed? I mean, seriously. I mean, I've heard Christians that say, we do nothing, period. God's grace, and He does it all for us, and this and that, and the other thing. And, I, and, and I, over the years, I've looked around, and I've seen Christians living in carnality, and I've seen Christians falling and staying down and living in defeat. And if I believe that, I have to put the blame on God. Because... He's the one that's supposedly doing it all through us, with or without my help. Well, I've heard it said, and I believe it, that uh, it goes something like this. Without God, we can't. Without us, he won't. God rewards those who diligently seek him. 1 Peter 1 says, giving all diligence, add to your faith. This and this and this and this. And then in verse 10, again, the word diligence is used, or diligently. Uh, something to that effect. Uh, so, study to show yourself approved unto God. Hasten, make haste to exert oneself. Endeavor, give diligence. That Bible is not going to jump off the table, open itself up, and start reading to you. Now, if you go to Bible Gateway, it will start reading to you if you press on the right options. But, uh, you know, you still got to go to the website and click on the little mic speaker thing to make it talk to you. Uh, but you got to do something. God, I heard it said, God's not interested in our abilities. He's interested in our availability. If Isaiah didn't say, here am I, send me, God wouldn't have sent him. Because God don't force us to do anything. So, study, earnest, diligence, exert oneself. Oh my gosh, it sounds like work. <laughs> Man, I thought we weren't supposed to talk about four-letter words like that. Work, you know. Uh, no, study. Now, approved, what does approved mean? Uh, pretty straightforward. <laughs> Accepted, particularly of coins and money, pleasing, and acceptable. I mean, I don't know what more to take out of that other than the thought that hit me was uh, when it came and it said particularly with regards to coins and money, I thought about the trial of our faith being better, pre more precious than gold. You know, just threw that in. I don't know what that has to do with the belt of truth, but uh, <clears throat> approved, accepted. Rightly divided, rightly dividing means to cut straight, to cut straight ways, to make straight and smooth, to handle right, to teach the truth directly and correctly. So, studying to show ourselves approved unto God doesn't have to do with our smarts. It doesn't have to do with uh, our abilities. It doesn't have to do with uh, passing an exam. It has to do with our hunger and our thirst. How much do I want God? How much do I want God? Am I willing to turn the TV off and pick the Bible up? Am I willing to pray? Oh God, am I willing to tell someone else about Jesus? Now we're getting on touchy ground. <laughs> um, it, that kind of study that shows us approved unto God is, is, is to exert oneself. Then, acceptable to God. To teach, to rightly divide, to teach the truth, truth directly and correctly. Um, I kind of like that because I tend to be fairly direct. <laughs> uh, with God's help, hopefully most of the time I'm correct. And, uh, but, you know, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is part of wearing the belt, part of the armor of God, is being diligent to, I don't know how you would say it, 
You're not making the belt, maybe strengthening the belt or strengthening how it affects me. I'm not really sure how to, how to say that, but we need to be rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, not impressing each other. Uh, that's not the point. But that earnest, diligent, hunger, thirst, that's what God's looking for. And that's what helps us effectively and properly wear the armor of the belt, uh, the, the belt of truth and the armor of God. The next part, we go back to Ephesians, chapter 6 here, which the next part which says here, uh, stand, stand there for having your loins girt about with truth. So I wanted to, I said loins. Okay, well, I kind of know what the loins are. Uh, I wanted to focus on that for a minute and um, talk about the loins girt with the belt of truth. So that's where we're putting the belt on the loins, so to speak. And in, of course, in, the, in armor and in the physical, well, that makes perfect sense. That's where the belt goes, is around your loins, around your waist area. <clears throat> But I find some interesting uh, spiritual applications. So I looked up uh, the word loins, and physically, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's what we think it is. Uh, but the definition uh, includes, it refers to the center of procreative power. I see some spiritual wheels turning already. Uh, <clears throat> It refers to the center of uh, procreative power. So in the natural, our loins are the center for where we can bring forth new life. Our loins are the center of where we make babies. That's what it's talking about, the procreative center. Uh, so in the physical, our loins is the place where we can bring forth new birth, new life. Brand new birth. Spiritually speaking, I'm sure this isn't a big stretch. Uh, with the truth, the belt of truth around our loins, we will, we will also carry the power to bring forth new life, new birth, salvation. That's kind of cool, I think. Um, the belt of truth, the gospel, Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 1.16, tells us that that is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus' substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection. If you know Jesus died in your place for your sins, and he was buried and he rose again from the dead, you have the power to, bring, to offer life to people. God's the only one that will bring life, but you have the power to offer it to everyone you meet. And all you got to know is Jesus died in your place for your sins. He was buried, rose again from the dead. That's the power of God unto salvation. That's the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That's the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. We need to be wearing the belt of truth, which would, of course, include, since it's Jesus and the Word of God, includes the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we have... In properly and correctly wearing the belt, the power of God to see new life come into being. And I can't, very little, I can't, let me think. I'll just say at this point, I can't think of anything more exciting than being involved in seeing someone come to Jesus. Is there anything? I can't, I can't think of anything. Except when I came to Jesus. That was more exciting. <laughs> um, because I was the recipient at that moment. Uh, but once you come to Jesus, I have, man, I can't think of experiencing anything more exciting than when you can lead someone to Christ. And the belt of truth is where it's at. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The belt of truth. So I, I looked at this and I thought, well, in what kind of forms does this um, 
new life look like? Uh, we've just been talking about it at, at some length here. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind is bringing new converts into the kingdom of God. Um, you know, sowing seeds, watering seeds. And then on the occasions that you get the joy of seeing God bring forth the increase. Yeah, nothing like it, except your own salvation. <laughs> um, but really, I, it's, that's, the, that's the first form that I look at, that this belt of truth, this new life, uh, that this, this power of the gospel at the loins, the place where a new life, well, that's kind of cool. Um, the other place I saw would be a new life in, in terms of uh, spiritual growth, maturity, um, really awesome when that happens and people are set free of areas of bondage in our own lives. Uh, that's, you know, when, when you're set free from something that's been dead and clinging on to you, that's, and then, I want, it's another step in that new life, that sanctification process. Uh, that's, that's another uh, place that's really exciting. And in 1 Peter, we read already, uh, 1 verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're wearing the belt of truth, but we also need the loins of our mind girt with truth. And um, another place the scripture will say, with the washing of the water of the word, here we are again back at the word of God, the truth, sanctify them, and the, Jesus praying to his Father for us. Got to believe that's a powerful prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. I am here to tell you if you study, hasten, make haste, exert oneself, endeavor, give diligence, God will sanctify. He will reward diligence. He's not a man that he should lie. God rewards those that diligently seek him. You know, gird up our minds. This is, a, this is an ongoing daily. Search the scriptures daily to see if those things are true. I would say if you haven't even listened to a preacher today or a teacher today, still search the scripture daily to see if what you heard yesterday was true. Or Sunday. Or Wednesday night. You know? Because any preacher or teacher who is doing their job is not afraid of you searching the scriptures. Because first of all, they've done it themselves. And second of all, if they're wrong, they want to be right. The only people who are afraid of you searching the scriptures are the ones that don't want to be proved wrong. Usually because they have some kind of vested interest or something. Anybody who uh, gives you any indication that you shouldn't check out what they teach, you know, uh, the roadrunner, two flames of fire behind you out the door. Uh, because anybody who's afraid to be tested by the word of God I wouldn't listen to them myself. I wouldn't listen to them myself because if they have any bits of truth, I can still get it from here. <laughs> you know, uh, but it's, it's a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And it, it, I've already mentioned it once tonight, but it always blows my mind that Jesus' disciples privately came to him in Matthew 24, verse 3. You'll see that they came privately to Jesus. So this isn't him teaching the multitudes. And they said, what's the sign of the end of the world and of your return? And the first words out of Jesus' mouth is, take heed that no one deceive you. I mean, there's some teaching out there that says it's impossible for Christians to be deceived. I guess they probably should have told Jesus that. <laughs> because he was telling the guys he trained himself, personally, face to face, take heed that no man deceive you. He didn't say, go warn everybody else. He said, you 
Take heed that no one deceive you. That blows me away. Uh, that, that, that the answer to the end of the world is take heed, don't be deceived. And then he goes on to the wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and all that other stuff. I'm not taking anything away from that. But the first sentence out of his mouth, which is often skipped, I find, is don't be deceived. Um, and the belt of truth, there's your answer to deception. Search the scriptures daily to see if these things are true. And what I really love about that is the Holy Spirit wrote that through Luke in the book of Acts and knowing full well that what the Bereans were searching was the Old Testament. A lot of people want to throw out the Old Testament. Not relevant for Christians. I guess they should have told the Holy Spirit that before he had Luke write that in Acts. Uh, because they were searching the Old Testament to see if what Paul was preaching in the New Covenant was true. And the Holy Spirit said, add a boy, guys. You know? Uh, so, searching with our minds, getting our minds renewed, uh, having, them lo having the loins of our minds girt with truth, the God's word, uh, doing this helps us align our thinking with God's. Isaiah 55, our, my, God's ways are not ours. His thoughts are not ours. He thinks so much differently than we do. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways higher than ours. So by diligently exerting oneself, making haste to study the scriptures, helps bring us in line with God's thinking. Critical for wearing the belt effectively. Critical for wearing the belt effectively. Um, and, it bring, and here's another one. It brings new life to our thoughts. What makes perfect, good, perfect, logical sense to me, now when I think something makes good, perfect, logical sense to me, I usually think about it twice or three or four times just to make sure that I'm hearing from God and not me. Because I know His ways aren't mine. You know? My, yeah, definitely not. When our thoughts and faith are in line with the Bible, our actions will follow. That's another reason to have that belt of truth worn properly, correctly, effectively, because the way we behave will follow our faith and our actions. So if you lose your job and your faith and trust in the Lord is not there, but it's in your resume, and you start frantically searching, running around like a chicken with your head cut off. I gotta do this, I gotta do that, I gotta. Okay. Having done all to stand, I'm not saying be lazy, but having done all to stand, stand in faith, trusting Jesus. God is my Father. What father who can is not going to provide for his kids? Well, let me rephrase that, because we're in a modern society where, whatever. What good father who can is not going to provide for his kids? Well, I have a perfect father. And he's gonna, he has taken care of me for 30 years. He took care of me before that. But 30 years I've acknowledged him taking care of me. Not always perfectly, to be sure. Uh, but trusting in Him, and when that belt of truth is proper, and our faith and our thinking lines up with God's, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word. You know? Uh, and so the belt of truth is critical for the whole armor of God. So uh, for conclusion here, a couple of thoughts. Uh, the importance of the belt of truth cannot be overstated. As we go into each piece of the armor, truth is the linchpin. You know, like, uh, you know, that's the key. We talk about faith, it's got to be in truth. We talk about the sword, it's got to be in truth. We talk about the breastplate, it's got to be in truth. The helmet of salvation, it's got to be in truth. Uh, you can't have any of these pieces of the armor properly if it's not right. 
So as with the physical armor of the soldier, the spiritual belt has to be properly fastened and tied. Uh, we must have all the necessary attachments to be effective in battle. Without proper applications of spiritual truth, the rest of the armor will not be effective. And then the last thoughts that I have uh, are three words in the scripture verse. Uh, the three words are practice, practice, practice. All right. And the scripture ver verse is 1 Timothy 4, 8. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Amen. Thank you for watching this broadcast. For more information about the ministry God has entrusted to us, please visit our website at www.christ-like.net Our Christ Life site offers many free downloadable resources. We hope you will visit us online soon and that our ministry will bless and strengthen your Christian life.